One of the most Welcome to the Sales Chaos Theory the Podcast, the go-to audio experience for navigating the ever-evolving landscape of sales conversations. Hosted by the dynamic duo Tim Ohai and Brian Lambert, how do you connect this with is your invitation to dive deep into the world of value communication like never before. Well, that's what we're In a market flooded with today. unpredictability we'll and constant change, Sales Chaos Theory is your guiding light, offering insights, strategies, and a much-needed clarity to help you find the patterns and drive amidst the mayhem. When you can this talk about is Sales Chaos Theory, where we make sense of the complexity language. in the market and help sales you lean chaos into it to rise above the fray and land Hello, more friends. Deals. Welcome to the Let's Sales dive in. Chaos Podcast. I'm Brian Lambert. And this is Tim O'Hein. And we are the authors of Sales Chaos, using agility selling to think and sell differently. Thanks so much for joining us. We're always looking for ways to help people who must rise to the challenge of responding to the business and sales strategy. If you are responsible for driving more valuable customer conversations and relationships at all levels in the organization, you've got to master the art of the conversation. And that's really what this podcast is about so that we can help you become a more effective and efficient trusted advisor. Cool. Hey, let's, let's just get right into this then, shall we? Um, I, so Brian, I got to tell you, I re- totally remember a time early in my career where uh, I talked with my very first successful business owner. The guy was um, a, a franchise business owner using a lot of our product um, in multiple states, um, considered a huge account for the region. Uh, and he started talking about financial numbers as we were doing an annual review. Yep. And I was just lost. <laughs> it just made yeah. no sense to me as he was going. Uh, literally within minutes, I just sat there staring at the PowerPoints going, oh, my God, uh, what are we talking about now? Fortunately, my sales manager was there, and he totally had everything covered. So he just jumped in, and um, he led essentially the rest of the conversation. And I just sat there taking notes as the junior kid in the room who was learning the ropes. But I'll never forget that moment. Yeah, I bet you had to capture a bunch of buzzwords and just uh, debrief it later. Oh, my God, you were talking about things like, <laughs> you know, he, even simple things like, you know, uh, ROI and whatnot. I was like, dude, really? I, really? I well, I'm going to have to look that one up. That works. How did you come up with that number? Because we were spitting numbers out and putting them on charts, and I'm like, how did we put that up there? <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that's funny to reflect back on. Um, yeah, I remember this time I was talking to uh, – a guy who sold services, and so obviously services, very intangible sale. And he was like, yeah, you know, we were in there and uh, talking to these uh, this executive team, and I got up and I started whiteboarding, and I was really, really uh, zeroing in on their business model. And uh, the first thing that popped into my head is, like, the advertising you know, slick of, like, people mod- <laughs> modeling clothes. And I'm like, what? Every- companies have a business model? Is that, like, their mascot? What's that? Is it an attractive person or something else? <laughs> right, right. right. So uh, once that that uh, passed after three or, three or four minutes, I, I, hear, I heard things like revenue streams and uh, adding value and converting, you know, intellectual property. I'm like, okay, so yeah, I'm just going to start <laughs> writing buzzwords down too, and uh, maybe I'll get debriefed uh, as well. But I was on a bigger team, so as, as a junior guy, um, I was able to just absorb it. And I think that's that's cool, right? You you absorb these things, you hopefully have a relationship with somebody to debrief them. And I think that's really what we're talking about here, uh, Tim, is, is being those guys to maybe bring some, some thoughts out here for, for folks that are new to sales. But more importantly, even if we've been in sales for a long time, I think it's important to revisit these basic tenants because this is where, where customer problems come from. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's like you're not really um, going to connect with those buyers if you don't understand this stuff, right? Yeah, that can be frustrating. Cool. Well, so from our perspective, we find the core problem here is usually one of just old fashioned ignorance. And and, and we're not trying to be mean about the word ignorance. Um, Not at all, actually. Uh, It's just that almost everyone's education in school was more about memorizing dates and history than teaching how a successful business runs. Um, And unless you've actually run a business or been involved with um, senior level leaders, there's just no way to learn this stuff. Yeah, that's right. And even if you've been in business for a long time, Business models and how businesses work are fundamentally different now than they were even 10 years ago. I mean, you can look at every single major industry and see upheaval and disruption, obviously because of the the internet and technology, but really because customers are demanding a new kind of value. So you've got the world's largest retailer in Amazon.com online with no physical stores, and you've got 
you know, a lot of news and, and media on, on iPads and, and devices. And, and, you know, 20 years ago, that was unheard of. So a lot of businesses are changing internally. So even if um, you have been in business for a while, it's good to think this through because when you're thinking about helping customers be successful, they're dealing with some real problems and some challenges that need mm. to be unpacked. It's huge. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we want to do in this podcast is, is uh, take a moment and unpack this a little bit. And we're not going to spend too long about it. Obviously, we're not trying to be uh, too academic here. What we're talking about is ways in which we're going to be able to communicate value. The first thing we want to do is find and discuss here five simple critical functions of any healthy business. And, and again, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but these five areas are in any business, doesn't matter what type of industry. Second, we want to give you guys a free, um, you know, this, this idea of, of practical actions. We're going to give you three practical actions that you can take to increase your understanding of how successful businesses work and ultimately be more relevant to, bu to buyers. So the five uh, things we're going to do here, these five areas that we're going to do first, and I'm just going to lay them out and then we can go back and talk about them, Tim, I'm thinking. Mm, go for it. So there are five areas. The first one we're going to explore is this idea of innovation and what is innovative to a customer or to a company. Uh, that's the a core area uh, of the first one we're going to explore. Then we're going to jump into this idea of revenue, uh, how they make money. Then we're going to get into finance, how they count the money. And then we're going to talk about legal and operations. So innovation, revenue, finance, legal, and operations. And the final, finally, one of that often is, is overlooked, I think, Tim, is, is in your, your, your passionate area. I'll let you share that one. It's the big reveal. Drum roll, please. What is well, the, last? the whole concept of management and leadership, right? Absolutely. Um, like you said, we'll get to that at the end. Keep going. Yep. So first off, when it comes to innovation, um, you know, what makes you different? That's the key. So when you're thinking about customers and you're in, engaged in a conversation, what truly makes them unique? And you got to get beyond the marketing fluff. When it comes to revenue, it's how do they make money? And, and marketing and sales obviously have to work together, but there's a lot more sales segments and there are a lot more sales channels available today. And, uh, you know, transacting has changed dramatically. So do you understand what that is and how that's morphed over time? From so a let, let me jump in real quick right here, Brian, because I think it's really important to separate innovation and revenue because a lot of people think that the revenue is what provides, you know, the innovation. But innovation is, is way more complex than that. It's not just, you know, your value proposition. Um, innovation is your differentiation. And it can be your product, but it can also just be how you work. Um, and a lot of groups, a lot of businesses struggle with differentiating themselves when they're in a market that's really mature, selling a product or a service that everybody else has. And their innovation comes from how they work. And they have to really get deep into understanding their business. And I, I find, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, a lot of folks don't know how to make themselves work differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's almost in every single function I'm finding, uh, the more you get into it. Uh, organizations uh, oftentimes are organized and, and run by silos in, in a mm -hmm. silo. And we hear about this a lot. And um, there's a lot out there on, you know, busting down a silo, breaking down the silos. But, but really, when you think about it, an organization organized kind of vertically and in silos, a lot of the problems that need to be solved today are horizontal ones. And they cut across mm -hmm. those functional groups. So innovation, uh, not only in making new products, like you said, but just in how they work. And, and uh, especially in today's more conceptual age, uh, where it's more about adding a different kind of value to your customers. That's a great well, point. And, and so then you fold in this whole idea of revenue. Revenue isn't just getting your message out in the market, look at our great innovation. There's real skill involved in communicating value. And yeah. There's, and there's process and there's all, all kinds of things that actually often gets overlooked when people are trying to just take innovation to the market. That's right. Yeah, I think um, when companies uh, are looking to bring new products to market, um, what they're talking about is really, uh, really important and, uh, you need salespeople to do it, but we're finding, I don't, you know, you and I work on a lot of clients. We're seeing a lot of, uh, sales organizations having to move up to sell higher in the organization. And there's actually a movement to, to move more of a transactional sale to just the internet where you don't need salespeople mm -hmm. anymore. And that used to be the world of selling 20 years ago. Uh, that idea of let me tell you about the, the products and, and be a product expert. So if you're not adding the right kind of value as a value communicator, you're really at risk of uh, becoming obsolete, <laughs> you know, from a revenue perspective. <laughs> I like the way Jeffrey Gittimer says, you just, you suck at sales. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's right. Okay, all right. Sorry. So go, so go back. I think we were talking about finance yeah. before. Yeah. So finance and legal, we can take them together. You know, finance is what do you do with the money that's coming in? And and it's interesting because new hybrid business models are are emerging. So the idea of where rec- re- revenue gets recognized has changed, and and the idea of what do you do with that money and how do you account for it. Uh, and that's probably why it's good to think about legal at the same time, because with new intellectual property laws, uh, new regulations, and just new, uh, you know, scrutiny, uh, especially in publicly traded companies, uh, it's important to understand that the law is there and uh, the regulations are there. You have to count the beans the right way. And a lot of, you, you know, the discussions that, that are driven inside of organizations, perhaps you're selling to, are actually really kind of managed by the financial and legal decisions. In other words, that helps kind of determine whether something's going to go forward or not. And obviously, you're going to end up in in a larger transformational deal, having some considerations and and needing to build that business case. So those are important to think through. And and that's also an an idea here is just think about how that's changed as well. Uh, the last piece. Can I add, just highlight one thing there. there? One more thought is that, you know, ultimately, you know, people think of finance and legal as obstacles or, you know, roadblocks to getting stuff done. Um, and, and really what they're supposed to be doing is helping guide decision making. Um, they're supposed to be the, the, the internal functions that help you either make the right decision about what to do with the money you have or the right decision to do just to meet your, your legal obligations or, and even your moral convictions. Um, and we're seeing even more and more in this social age that we're in that that your moral convictions have a massive impact not only on your your legal obligations but your revenue opportunities and even how you innovate. Um, look for example at environmental stuff. Look at look for example at um, uh, uh, equality and uh, uh, civil rights. There's all kinds of things. They're genuinely changing business models, and it's coming not from the traditional innovation or revenue perspective, but just the legal and finance. And I, I, a lot of the business owners I talk to and the senior, senior execs, they're struggling to keep up with it because it's just moving so fast. Yeah. And then that leads to um, this idea of uh, converting resources into value or converting uh, knowledge into value, and that's the operational piece that I laid out earlier. Um, mm-hmm. This is, if you're in the revenue space and, and you're selling that vision, uh, the operational bucket is how, how are you going to execute on that vision sold or how are you going to deliver on that promise? And boy, things have really changed there. I mean, uh, a lot of the bias in, in the business world is around this idea of, of manufacturing and, and lean and thinking through process and Six Sigma and driving efficiencies on the operational side. But, uh, you know, there's not a lot out there, uh, Tim, on, on this idea of how do we link our operational view to what we're promising to clients and who's responsible for that because uh, it's oftentimes us value communicators that are stuck in the middle there. It's, you just said a major word, the whole idea of promises. And, and for me and the way I think, um, I like to think that operations is about how those promises that you're making are going to get carried out. Carried out. And I, people are having to make more complex promises to sell, especially for um, the big opportunities. And when you're talking to a senior executive, how you carry out your promise is um, frankly probably the only thing that matters to them. It probably matters the promise you made because promises are empty. Uh, executives have become immune to the promises of salespeople. And what they're looking for is reputation and execution. And, and right. I, I just go, I'm going to hold up the mirror. Anybody listening right now who's in sales, well, do you know how your own company's operations work? Because that is the meat of whatever promise you're making. So when I say operations, I'm talking supply chain and manufacturing and even, even purchasing and procurement. Um, I'm talking HR, I'm talking IT. Um, and some of you have companies that you work for that are so big that each of those buckets within the operations model is separated into their own functions because they're so big and so complex. Uh, but that is that is a massively misunderstood uh, area for a lot of the sellers that I talk with and coach. Yep, absolutely. Let's keep moving. 
Okay, cool. Um, so the, the last thing we wanted to talk about was this concept of management and leadership. And, and let me just be real clear on how I define those. Management, um, I know you people like to you know, put management down and leadership up. Um, let me give you uh, kind of our definition of what we have. Management is about optimizing, making things better than what they are with what you currently have. And leadership is about transformation. How do you literally make things different, going in a whole new direction, uh, perhaps even um, without any of the resources in place? So it's, it's when you look at those five areas of innovation, revenue, finance, legal, and operations, are, is, is the client you're working with, are they trying, and hear this, are they trying to optimize those things or transform those things? Just having that discussion is a massively relevant topic to just about every single executive that Brian and I talk with. Uh, I, I literally, I'm trying to think, Brian, I can't think of anybody um, in the last few years that we've talked to that that topic has not just opened up into a, a full-on uh, a smorgasbord of opportunity. Yeah, especially for uh, value communicators if they understand the difference. I mean, when you think about it, I, 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 if we do our job well and we are intimately aware of these areas of business and how we impact them, we will, we will be able to drive a change in how our customers work. I think salespeople and other value communicators that are out there don't really remember that. They think it's about getting the product into the hands of the customer, for example. But really, if we do our job right, it's about helping them change how they work. And you know, certainly the business strategy may call for an optimization approach, but what does that actually mean in your client? Mm. And same thing for transformation. You know, from, from from what, you know, what's the old state uh, and, and uh, to what, you know, what's the new state? And I think not really understanding that really minimizes our value. And uh, that's not going to lead to that, that deal that you're looking for. Totally cool. All right. So we want to keep this moving. So let's, let's talk about three actions that you can do right out of the gate if you want to get better at these things. So the first one is is go interview business leaders and business owners. Uh, you've got to have people in your own company you can go talk to. Um, you might even have family members and, and certainly at least friends or neighbors that you can go talk to. Ask them how they do what they do. If they, if they run the whole business, literally walk them through all five of these topics. If they only run or are responsible for one aspect, then, then find out what they do. Go deep on them on that one aspect of business. Um, you've got five topics to explore. Explore them all. And, and, and actually, we say the easiest way to explore a function is just ask them about the kind of problems that they have problem, uh, trouble solving. Uh, find out what the biggest, most gnarliest, um, most recurring uh, issues and challenges that pop up in their function over and over again. Um, and then ask what they do to address those problems. The key here is that if you become an expert in the kinds of problems that are associated with each of these functions, you become massively more relevant to your customers because you can help them understand things that they themselves might not fully understand. Um, and, and here's, here's just a simple bonus we're going to offer. You send us an email will send you an interview guide that you can use to talk with these folks so you show up prepared even better for those interviews. Brian, what's our email? It's info at agilityselling.com. I in F as in Frank, O at agilityselling.com. Awesome. Okay. Brian, what's the second action people can do? Yeah. Uh, so the second thing that I would suggest and that we've come up with together is this idea of getting on the internet and just searching for the phrase business acumen. Um, you know, we do a lot of uh, training events uh, with uh, sellers and we're actually talking to their sales managers. And what we're finding is because uh, folks have not revisited these five areas in a long time, or perhaps they're making assumptions, uh, th that they haven't really developed this thing called business acumen. Um, and we actually uh, have done research uh, in the past where we asked customers what they were looking for from, from value communicators. And this idea of understanding my business was critical. You've got to be able to speak the language of business. And so spend some time learning how all these functions are actually supposed to work. Um, get that idea of, of the ideal state. And if you've done some of those interviews that Tim suggested, you can also use uh, that to really develop some of the problems that you've, uh, you've uncovered. And you can think that through uh, and how those problems affect each domain or each function. 
this, uh, you know, this idea of doing some research and being proactive about that research uh, can really put you on the path of becoming an expert in the topics that your customers will most respect. So that's thing number two to try. What about three, Tim? Number three is really easy, and it'll, it'll almost always be an action for you to take, and that's just ask us. Uh, drop your question in the comment section below this podcast, um, and we will get to you. Because honestly, we really want this to be a community that's where right. all kinds of people can come and, and find the value that, that really you need, that they need to be more effective and fulfilled as a professional seller. Uh, the hardest part of being in the sales business is that you're often swimming alone. Uh, and, and we really, our whole intention for agility selling, um, just as a vision is to build a community where people can get really quick quality answers, um, that, that change the way they sell to help people think differently and ultimately sell differently. And, and honestly, when you ask a question in, in the comment section, you're actually creating a dialogue that other people can leverage. It really helps us all. Yeah, it definitely helps us all. You know, um, I'm just coming off the road here for a week, spending a lot of time with, with some uh, value communicators and salespeople. And, you know, I always learn from them too. You know, it's not like we have all the mm-hmm. answers, right? We've just uh, really invested some time to, to understand this uh, profession that we're in, but we definitely appreciate that comment and, and, uh, and really the dialogue. So there you go. Um, you know what? If you, if you want to be relevant in executive level conversations and align to customer functions, to create that value that Tim and I have been talking about, you have to understand how your customers work and you have to understand what functions uh, exist within their business. And you have to think that through and more importantly, how those functions work together in that horizontal or cross-functional view that I was talking about, you know, knowing this stuff's really going to help you. It's going to help you be successful. It's going to help you position and communicate value better. And that's really what it's all about being a value communicator. So uh, that's it for today on behalf of, uh, Tim and myself, we invite your thoughts, comments, and feedbacks. And you know what? As a value communicator, remember this. Remember that tips and tricks don't save the world. You've got to find your own way to communicate value to buyers at every interaction so you can turn chaos into opportunity. Thanks so much for joining us today. See you next time. Thank you for listening.